The Mystery of the Semi-Detached by E. Nesbitt Recorded by Adrian Pretzelis He was waiting for her. He had been waiting an hour and a half in a dusty suburban lane, with a row of big elms on one side and some eligible building sites on the other, and far away to the southwest the twinkling yellow lights of the Crystal Palace. It was not quite like a country lane, for it had a pavement and lamp-posts. But it was not a bad place for a meeting all the same, and farther up, toward the cemetery, it was really quite rural, and almost pretty, especially in twilight. But twilight had long deepened into the night, and still he waited. He loved her, and he was engaged to be married to her, with the complete disapproval of every reasonable person who had been consulted. And this half-clandestine meeting was to-night to take the place of the grudgingly sanctioned weekly interview, because a certain rich uncle was visiting at her house, and her mother was not the woman to acknowledge to a moneyed uncle, who might go off any day, a match so deeply ineligible as hers with him. So he waited for her, and the chill of an unusually severe May evening entered into his bones. The policeman passed him with a surly response to his good night. The bicyclists went by him like grey ghosts with fog horns, and it was nearly ten o'clock, and she had not come. He shrugged his shoulders and turned toward his lodgings. His road led him by her house, desirable, commodious, semi-detached, and he walked slowly as he neared it. She might even now be coming out, but she was not. There was no sign of movement about the house, no sign of life, no lights even in the windows, and her people were not early people. He paused by the gate, wondering. Then he noticed that the front door was open, wide open, and the street lamp shone a little way into the dark hall. There was something about all this that did not please him, that scared him a little indeed. The house had a gloomy and deserted air. It was obviously impossible that it harboured a rich uncle. The old man must have left early, in which case— He walked up the path of patent glazed tiles and listened. No sign of life. He passed into the hall. There was no light anywhere. Where was everybody, and why was the front door open? There was no one in the drawing-room, and the dining-room and the study, nine feet by seven, were equally blank. Everybody was out, evidently, but the unpleasant sense that he was perhaps not the first casual visitor to walk through that open door impelled him to look through the house before he went away and close it after him. So he went upstairs, and at the door of the first bedroom he came to, he struck a wax match, as he had done in the sitting-rooms. Even as he did so, he felt that he was not alone. And he was prepared to see something, but for what he saw he was not prepared. For what he saw lay on the bed, in a white, loose gown, and it was his sweetheart and its throat was cut from ear to ear. He doesn't know what happened then, nor how he got downstairs and into the street, but he got out somehow, and the policeman found him in a fit under the lamp-post at the corner of the street. He couldn't speak when they picked him up, and he passed the night in the police cells, because the policeman had seen plenty of drunken men before, but never one in a fit. The next morning he was better, though still very white and shaky, but the tale he told the magistrate was convincing, and they sent a couple of constables with him to her house. There was no crowd about it, as he fancied there would be, and the blinds were not down. As he stood, dazed, in front of the front door, it opened, and she came out. He held onto the doorpost for support. "'She's all right, you see,' said the constable, who had found him under the lamp. "'I told you you was drunk, but you would know best.' 
When he was alone with her, he told her not all, for that would not bear telling, but how he had come into the commodious semi-detached, and how he had found the door open and the lights out, and that he had been into that long back room facing the stairs, and had seen something, in even trying to hint at which he turned sick and broke down, and had to have brandy given him. But my dearest, she said, I dare say the house was dark, for we were all at the Crystal Palace with my uncle, and no doubt the door was open, for the maids will run out if they're left. But you could not have been in that room, because I locked it when I came away, and the key was in my pocket. I dressed in a hurry, and left all my odds and ends lying about. I know, he said, I saw a green scarf on a chair, and some long brown gloves, and a lot of hairpins and ribbons and a prayer book, and a lace handkerchief on the dressing table. Why, I even noticed the almanac on the mantelpiece. Twenty one October. At least, it couldn't be that, because this is May, and yet it was. Your almanac is at twenty one October, isn't it? No, of course it isn't, she said, smiling rather anxiously. But all the other things were just as you say. You must have had a, a dream or a vision or something. He was a very ordinary, commonplace, city young man, and he didn't believe in visions, but he never rested day or night till he got his sweetheart and her mother away from that commodious semi-detached, and settled them in a quiet, distant suburb. In the course of the removal he incidentally married her, and the mother went on living with them. His nerves must have been a good bit shaken, because he was very queer for a long time and was always inquiring if any one had taken the desirable semi-detached. And when an old stockbroker with a family took it, he went the length of calling on the old gentleman and imploring him by all that he held dear not to live in that fatal house. Why? said the stockbroker, not unnaturally. And then he got so vague and confused, trying to tell why and trying not to tell why, that the stockbroker showed him out and thanked his God that he was not such a fool as to allow a lunatic to stand in the way of his taking that remarkably cheap and desirable semi-detached residence. Now the curious and quite inexplicable part of this story is that when she came down to breakfast on the morning of the 22nd of October, she found him looking like death, with the morning paper in his hand. He caught hers, he couldn't speak, and pointed to the paper. And there she read that on the night of the twenty-first a young lady, the stockbroker's daughter, had been found with her throat cut from ear to ear on the bed in the long back bedroom facing the stairs of that desirable semi-detached. End of The Mystery of the Semi-Detached by E. Nesbitt